Welcome to the grammar lesson for chapter 9 alpha, Epanegris alpha. We begin with a word study. Democracy is our first word. It comes from e democratia, which is formed from two parts, odemos, people, remember, and kratos, power or rule. In English, we will often replace the tia ending or kia ending with cy. Thus, a democratia becomes democracy. The next word is demagogue, which comes from the Greek odemogogos, which has two parts, odemos, again, the people, plus ago or agogos, leading. So this is a leader of people, a demagogue. The word now is used in a pejorative sense of a politician who unscrupulously appeals to the emotions and selfish interests of the electorate. Demography comes from odemos, again, people, plus a grafe, a writing. So thus, demography is the recording of information about people groups. Endemic comes from the same Greek word, endemos, which has two parts, the preposition in plus odemos. So in the people or among the people, prevalent among the people or, or native. Nosemata is the Greek word for diseases. So endemata nosemata is endemic diseases or native diseases, diseases prevalent among the people. Epidemic, likewise, comes from demos with a prepositional prefix, epidemeo, a verb, it literally means I live among my people or I live at home, but of diseases, the disease lives among the people or it is widespread. Pandemic, likewise, was an ancient word, pandemos, belonging to the whole people, and it was used of diseases by Galen in the second century AD. Pandemic is distinguished from epidemic in a wider effect. Specifically, it's prevalent over a whole people or continent. Well, that's it for the word study. On to the grammar lesson. In this chapter, we will focus on incomplete or present active participles. And we'll see how these active forms look on noble roots, athematic roots, epsilon contract roots, and alpha contract roots. Before we get into the active stems, let's review the passive stems that we have learned earlier. Words have multiple parts, including the root, which tells us the core meaning of the word, whether it's singing or jumping. Stems can tell us the part of speech, whether it's a verb or a noun, as well as aspect and voice. And endings tell us very specific things. In terms of nouns, it will tell us number and case. And in terms of verbs, it will tell us number and person and sometimes voice. So as far as participles go, we had our verb root, our noble root that we learned was luo. Then we had our aspectual marker, o, telling us that it's imperfect, which is used for the present. And then we had an additional stem marker telling us it was a participle and not just a regular verb. And in the passive, that additional marker was men, telling us the part of speech. It's a participle, not a verb. Then we added our case endings on the end of that to yield the masculine omenos, the feminine omene, and the neuter omenon. Here's a chart with all of those endings conjugated. Notice I have the Second declension, the masculine neuter forms in blue, and the first declension in pink. The whole chart is yellow because when I show you a verb mood chart, I'm going to have different colors for different moods. The indicative will be white, and the participles will be yellow. Well, now let's look at active participle stems. Active participle stems, just like their passive counterpart, will have an aspectual stem marker. In this case, we're looking at present or imperfect participles, so O is our aspectual stem marker. And then our part of speech marker, telling us it's a participle, is UNT, telling us also that it's active. It's, it distinguishes active from passive, MEN being the middle passive, and UNT being the active participle stem. Then connecting on that, we will have our case endings. For the active forms, instead of using a 2-1-2 case ending pattern, we will use a 3-1-3 case ending pattern. So the masculine and the neuter forms will use third declension, and the feminine will use the first declension. Here's a review of the third declension forms. 
Our nominative masculine and feminine form is s and nothing for the neuter at all. The genitive form is os for all genders. The dative has an iota. In fact, it is only an iota. The accusative in the masculine forms is either alpha or nu. The neuter is nothing to match the nominative. Neuter nominatives are always the same as their accusatives. And the vocative is the same as the nominative. In the plural, neuter plural endings are always alpha. And the masculine and feminine will be s. The genitive plural is the same in every declension, own. And the dative plural has the iota, as all datives do. And it has a sigma, usually just c. The accusative is similar to the nominative. It's identical in the neuter, just alpha. And then in the, and then in the masculine, it's normally os. So here's a chart of how those endings look when connected to the active participle stem. Now you'll notice some strange forms like the masculine nominative singular, luon, or the feminine form, lu, so it doesn't even look like it has the active participle stem, the owned. So I will explain how these endings combined with the active participle stem to form what we have here in this chart. Now you don't have to remember all of this process by any means. I just want to show you that yes, we are dealing with one consistent stem here, owned, and then our endings are equally consistent, a 313 pattern. In the end, you will have to memorize this paradigm rote just because participles are so common, but it is reassuring to know the language is working consistently. Okay, so let's look at the formation of present participle forms in the masculine nominative singular. We won't worry about the root, we'll just start with the thematic stem, the stem that shows us we're dealing with an incomplete aspect that we use for the present, and that is Omicron. Then we continue with more letters of stem, letting us know what part of speech we're working with, that it's a participle, not an indicative verb. And the active participle form is new tof. I have the thematic portion of the stem in red, like I do with the indicative verbs. And then the part of speech form of the stem I have in green letters here, the part that's telling us it's an active participle, uh, to distinguish it from the thematic part of the stem and to keep that consistency with my indicative verb charts. Now this is our entire present participle stem. To this we just add our third declension endings for masculine and neuter forms and our first declension endings for feminine forms. The masculine nominative singular form is sigma. I have the third declension forms in orange, uh, distinguishing them from the blue second declension and the pink first declension. According to our principles of euphony, dentals prior to sigma drop out. This creates another problem. Typically we can't follow a nasal with a sigma, so we either have to drop out the sigma or get rid of the nasal. In this case, they got rid of the sigma. And when we remove a letter for this reason, we have to compensate by lengthening a vowel. And so the omicron becomes omega. Thus we have our masculine nominative singular ending on. You don't have to remember that whole process. You do have to memorize the paradigm, but it is helpful to recognize that it's not just arbitrary changes in spelling. There actually is a method to the madness. Most of the other masculine forms are far more regular. We start with our aspectual stem. We add the active part of speech portion of the stem, nt, and then we add our genitive ending, os. Since we alternate between consonants and vowels, there aren't any contractions or problems, so this is our genitive singular masculine form, ondos. Ondi is the dative form. Onda is the accusative. Ondes the nominative plural. Ondon is the genitive plural. It's everyone's favorite genitive plural ending because it's the same in each declension. Now the dative plural is a little more difficult. We'll start with the aspectual stem, as always. Add our active part of speech portion of the stem. And then our ending, our third declension ending is C, sigma iota. Dentals drop prior to sigma. And then we have the problem again of a nasal followed by a sigma. This time, in contrast to the nominative singular, instead of getting rid of the sigma, we will get rid of the nasal and compensate by lengthening the vowel, this time to its digraph form, u, instead of omega. The result is usi, which looks identical to the third person 
plural indicative stem and ending, but you will be able to distinguish the dative plural participle ending from the third person plural indicative ending because participles will often have an article. And your article in front of a word with this stem and ending would be tus, tof, omicron, iota, sigma, and you would never see that in front of an indicative verb. The masculine accusative plural form is regular as before. We have the aspectual stem, active part of speech portion of the stem, and then os as our third declension ending. Here's what it looks like in the context of the paradigm. Notice the only two places where we have brown, a combination of orange and black, is the nominative singular and the dative plural. That is because those are the two places where the ending began with a sigma and created difficulties with that liquid inside the part of speech stem. Let's move on to the feminine endings. You'll notice that they look a little different. Instead of luon or luondos, we have lusa. Let's find out what happened there. We'll start with our aspectual stem. We'll add our active participial part of speech portion of the stem and then we will add our first declension ending. It actually was iota alpha because adjectives of the consonant declension or the third declension that have a separate feminine form that where the feminine is first declension and the masculine is third, inflect the feminine with a short alpha. Normally the first declension has a long alpha, but in these situations it has a short alpha and in addition an iota is placed in front of it. And this information can be found in point 294 and 295 of Smythe's grammar. Furthermore, to add support for the presence of this iota, in point 221, he says most, if not all, substantives in the short alpha forms are formed by the addition of a suffix iota, or the semi-vowel iota alpha. Thus, from glota, the two tofs, is originally from glochia, and he gives other examples. The yoda was a semi-vowel and pronounced as a Y, so ya. And then after tof, it would be pronounced tia, which is a little hard to say. And in point 113 of Smythe's grammar, we read that an internal tof yoda or theta yoda will change to a sigma through a process of tia turning to tsa. The yoda turns into a sigma. And then you know what happens to dentals prior to sigma. They drop out. And now we have the nasal sigma issue. You can tell from the chart what happened, which one they chose to remove. They chose to remove the nu, and then compensated by lengthening the omicron to its digraph form, u. The result was usa. Now we typically expect eta to follow letters that are not epsilon, iota, or rho. But as we see here, there are a class of words, usually with a sigma combination letter or a double tof, that have that alpha ending. An example is trapeza. But then in the genitive and dative, it reverts to what we would expect, the eta, trapezes, or in this case, uses. The dative would be use, the yoda subscript, and the accusative reverts back to the alpha form, usan. In the plural, all first declension words are alpha patterns, so we have use, uson, uses, and usas. Here's what it looks like again in our paradigm. Lusa, luses, luse, lusan, lusa, luse, luson. Remember, all first declension words in the genitive plural are, are accented on their ultima. Luses, lusas. Now let's take a look at the neuter forms. They only differ from the masculine forms in the nominative and accusative. As we take a closer look, we'll start with our aspectual stem, omicron, then the active participial part of speech stem, nt, neutaf. The neuter nominative singular ending is nothing. And as we read in Smythe's grammar, point 133, no consonant except nu, rho, or sigma can stand at the end of a Greek word. All other consonants are dropped. The exceptions are proclitics because those technically don't end a word. They're connected to the front of another word. So X, for example, is a proclitic and that C isn't truly ending a word. 
Thus, Toph, not being a new rho or sigma, drops. And there we have the neuter nominative singular form. It's also the same as the accusative. In the genitive, we bring the Toph back, and we can simply add our genitive third declension ending, os. The dative, we add the third declension ending, e. And neuter accusatives are always the same as their nominatives. The ending is nothing. Toph can't stand at the end of a word, so it drops, and we're left with own. The neuter nominative plural ending is alpha, and then all genitive plurals are the same, own. The dative plural goes under the same transformation as the masculine dative plural. C is added. Toph drops out before sigma. Nu and sigma can't be placed together. The nu is removed, and then we compensate by lengthening the vowel. Omicron turns into Omicron Ypsilon. And then the neuter accusative plural form is the same as the neuter nominative plural form, onda. That explains all of the active participle forms with the incomplete stem, the, the present active participle. Here's what it looks like with the noble root. Now to move on, actually we're moving a little previously in your book to the athematic root, the verb to be, as is our root, that reveals itself as omicron. So if you just see what looks to be participle stem and endings with no root whatsoever, it is actually the form of to be as a participle. So own is being. Uh, the genitive ondos is of the one being. And the dative is to or for the one being, etc. We only have two other types of roots to look at in this chapter. The epsilon contract root and the alpha contract root. Let's take a look at the epsilon contract root first. We're going to use phile as our root, love. We can see it at the top of this chart, phile plus the aspectual stem o, plus the active participle part of speech stem nt, plus our 313 pattern ending. One thing to notice in the paradigm is that it's predominated by the digraph omicron ypsilon u through nearly the entire paradigm except for the first form. So let's take a look at these. For the first form, we begin with our root, phile, we will add our masculine nominative singular ending, own, and we already know how that was developed. When those two vowels are placed next to each other, they contract epsilon plus omega. Omega always swallows up any contract vowel that it follows. So these two vowels contract to form philon, the masculine nominative singular subject loving something. Now all the other forms, we'll take a look at the genitive form. We'll begin with the root as well, phila plus ondos is our genitive ending. Here we see that epsilon followed by omicron will contract together to form u. And that explains all of those digraphs in the chart. Since all of our stems begin with omicron or omicron upsilon, that's basically what we see through this whole paradigm. So down the masculine column we have philon, philundos, philundi, philunda, philundes, philundon, philusi, philundas. Down the feminine column, we originally had the omicron epsilon stem, and that walks right over epsilon, just like the omega did, to form philusa, philuses, philuse, etc. Notice the accent this time is always over the penult because the epsilon, the antepenult, is swallowed up in there. In the nominative, we can tell the alpha is short because when we have this combination of short ultima plus long penult, and we're going to accent the penult, the penult must receive a circumflex. In the genitive, we see that the ultima is long, and so circumflex can't get out there to the penult, so we have to suffice with the acute. This tells us that the alpha in the nominative and the accusative singular is short. The contractions in the neuter column are the same as the contractions in the masculine column where we had omicron beginning our stem, it contracts with the root ending epsilon to form u. Onto the alpha contract root, we're going to use tima, honor, as our root. In the masculine nominative form, we see the same pattern as in the epsilon contract. The omega, as it walked right over epsilon, omega will also walk right over alpha in these alpha contracts. So the masculine nominative singular of, of this alpha contract verb is timon. As we add the genitive form to our alpha contract root, we will see how omicron combines with alpha. And we see that those two letters contracted together form omega. And the same will be true for the digraph omicron epsilon. 
So our alpha contract paradigm for participles has omegas consistently all the way through as a contraction between the alpha root and the initial thematic vowel of the stem. Let's go back to our noble root and look at all of the forms we have learned so far. I've organized this chart according to mood. In the top left quadrant, colored white, we have the indicative, both the active and middle forms, luo, luis, lui. And following along the second person rows, on the right side of this chart, we have a reddish quadrant showing the imperatives, lue, luita in the active, and lu, luista in the middle and passive. I have the infinitives in gray on the bottom. Luin is our active infinitive, and luista is our middle passive infinitive. And now we have our yellow participle quadrant. And in our active column, we have luon, the masculine nominative singular, luusa, our feminine nominative singular, and luon, our neuter nominative singular. It's a little strange to have our nominatives going down, uh, but I wanted to keep them all in their active column and compare them to the middle forms here, luomenos, luomene, luomenon. So these three nominative forms of each voice should jog your memory enough to create both the active yellow participle chart and the passive yellow participle chart. And there we have all of our present participles, both active and middle. Again, you don't have to memorize the history of how all of these forms were created, but you do have to memorize all of the active participle forms. And I think just kind of knowing the history and that these stems are consistent helps in that. So, Take some time and memorize all of these new participial forms. Basically, you're working on the third declension. You're going to have lots of nouns and adjectives that follow the same 313 consonant stem pattern. So you're actually doing a lot of work that's going to pay off in the future by learning this participial paradigm. Have fun with the exercises. Keep up the good work. And don't forget to keep reviewing those stories many times until you can start using the participles and thinking about the participles and not just translating them. That's going to take some significant time and effort, but that's to be expected since Greek uses its participle far more than we do in English.